Councilmember Blumenfield is Here. present. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Absent. Councilmember Rodriguez. Here. Councilmember Lee. Present. Four members and a quorum, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Today we have 10 items to consider and uh, no special agenda, right? Great, amazing. Just 10 items on the regular agenda and hopefully we can get through this meeting quickly and efficiently. Item one is a verbal update from LASA on the LA Grand Hotel demobilization plan. Item two is the 13th CAO report on the homeless emergency account uh, for the week ending March 15th. And item three is the 12th report in that same category. Item four is the 23rd roadmap report from the CAO. And I believe that the CAO has an amendment to this item that if um, you could come and read it, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, my name is Michael Zambrano with the Office of the CAO. It is rec uh, requested that the Housing and Homelessness Committee amend the recommendations of the 23rd COVID-19 Homelessness Roadmap Funding Report dated March 29th, uh, 2024 as follows. Recommendation 17, approve up to $122,000 for the operations of the La Cienega Motel located at 1725 South La Cienega Boulevard with 20 beds in Council District 5, not to exceed six months through June 30th, 2024. Uh, recommendation 17A, Appropriate $122,000 from the Homeless Efforts County Funding Agreement Fund number 63Q, Department 10, account number 10T618, Homeless Effort County Funding Agreement 2, Homeless yeah. Efforts County Funding Agreement Fund number 63Q, Department 43, account number 43YC29, 2023-24 Other Interim Housing Operations for the Operations Cost of the La Cienega Motel located at 1725 South La Cienega Boulevard in Council District 5 through June 30th, 2024. And recommendation 25, uh, approve and appropriate $107,639 of HAP3 funding from Citywide Leasing Fund 100, uh, Department 63, account number 000027, a bridge home leasing to GSD fund number 100, Department 40, account number 003180, construction materials for the leasing costs of 711 North Alameda Street, uh, Puente Trailers. And that concludes the, uh, the amendments. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for reading that. I did not want to. Um, item five is CAO and LAHD reports regarding funding awards for nine projects and three alternate projects for the ULA Accelerator Plus program. Item six is a report that uh, basically identifies all of the homelessness related outreach teams in the city including council office funded teams a piece of information that we had been waiting for for a while so thank you to the CAO for providing that and I think allows us some more information for future planning um, item 7 is an LAHD report about evictions under the Ellis Act um, and the feasibility of amending the RSO to um, address some of the challenges that we've seen recently item 8 is a report about the current Ellis Act process taking place at Barrington Plaza Apartments in Council District 11. Item nine is an LAHD report about amending a residential ground lease agreement for a project located very close to here um, in CD 14 at 232 North Judge John Aiso Street. And item 10 is a motion regarding additional funding and a contract amendment for the environmental cleanup of the Slauson Wall site. <coughs> located in CD9. And with that, let's move to public comment. And uh, I just wanna make sure we have our interpreter here. Great. Um, and we have our city attorney gonna read us some instructions. Hi, hi everyone. Um, to members of the public, when it is your turn to speak, please state the name you signed up under, which agenda items you would like to speak, and whether or not you would like to uh, provide general public comment. You have one minute per item, up to two minutes total for the items on the agenda, and one minute for general public comment if you wish. You get a maximum speaking time of up to, up to three minutes per person. Please speak to the agenda items before beginning general public comment. We will inform you when your time is up. When speaking on agenda items, you must be on a topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you, are not on, if you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you're speaking on topic, you'll get a brief warning from me or the committee chair. 
If you do not immediately and clearly get back on topic, or if you stray off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your time and we'll move, you to the ne we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, and today we'll be taking a, a half an hour of public comment. I'll call some speakers. Uh, let's start with somebody who signed up as Nithya is late to the meeting. I wasn't. Um, Carlos Aguilar, Elisa Rodriguez, and Hassan Zuniga. And thank you, Councilmember Harris Dawson, for joining us. Please make your way up to the podium if I called your name. Your name and the items you wish to speak on. Yes, I'd like the three minutes uh, for items seven, eight, and public comment. Okay, so you have two minutes actually. Two minutes. Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, Carlos, Aguilar. <laughs> Carlos Aguilar with Coalition for Economic Survival. Uh, actions to address the Ellis Act. Uh, the Ellis Act impacts are way overdue. CS's tracking map shows that LA has lost nearly 28,000 rent controlled affordable units since 2001, all due to Ellis Act. Tenants, tens of thousands of city renters have been displaced from their communities, this city and the state, due to the inability to find comparable priced housing once they lose their rental units. Children have been ripped out of schools and people separated from their social networks and services like doctors and pharmacies that they depend on. Ridding, of the, ridding ourselves of the Ellis Act should be a priority. How are we to solve our homeless crisis if we are throwing more people on the street than getting them off the street? We support the proposals being advanced by LAHD, but they are not enough. The city should support eliminating the Ellis Act. Short of that, penalties for the Ellis Act violators should be increased. Using the Ellis Act for renovations such as Barrington Plaza must be prohibited. Support for legislation that prohibits speculators from using the Ellis Act within five years of property purchase and limiting use of Ellis Act by serial evictors is a start. We can't build our way out of this affordable housing crisis, so preserving our existing affordable housing is needed while we build new affordable units. Well, but with Barrington Plaza, it's a series of missed opportunities for the city. If you want to see a bogus Ellis Act application, this is it. For years, Douglas Emmett attempted to get exemptions to the RSO to evict tenants, renovate, and jack up rents. Failing that, they've, they, were, uh, they sought support from the council, new council representative, and tenants are still lacking assist, assistance. They've lied about mandates from the city that they make repairs. With our help, tenants have organized to file a lawsuit of their own because they have not gotten the support that they needed. We urge the council to stand up to, uh, to the Ellis Act, support the Barrington Plaza tenants and tenants all over LA, and say no to Douglas Emmett and those who see a crisis and want to profit Thank from it. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Next speaker, Elisa Rodriguez, Hassan Zuniga, I'll call two other names, Lucia Avat and Lupita Gonzalez. Next speaker, please make your way to the podium. Your name and the items? Yes, Hassan Suniga, and the items will be public comment and item number seven. Okay, you have two minutes. Thank you. Well, um, hello, y'all, council members of the, of the Housing Committee and Homelessness. Um, we're here, you know, to make sure that you guys uh, hear about the supporting the seven protections amendments on the anti-harassment. Recently, we had a meeting with uh, Maurice from District 8 office, and we talked about the importance also of the rent control, uh, an initiative to make sure that it's both enhanced, you know, at the same time. People, are, you know, that I'm helping as an organizer at ACE in District A and areas, I'm listening to tenants that are dealing with harassment from, you know, getting landlords sending them notices, you know, that are to refix or to do something, but they're not, you know, properly noticed, and they're using that to harass. Also, tenants that are being increased with more than where they're supposed to on rent control units. So just making sure that our council member Bob um, remembers that we need to introduce this as soon as possible. And thank you for Nitya and everybody that has already heard about Tahoe that is planning to support. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Elisa Rodriguez, and I would like to speak on the Tenant, um, tenant Anti-Harassment Act. 
That's not on the agenda today, but you can speak on, on that on general the, the public one, comment. I probably said it wrong. The one that Hassan just said. The same matter. Um, public, public comment. comment. I'm yeah, sorry. You have, you I, can, I you, misspoke. Yes. No, no. That's okay. You have one minute. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, hello. My name is Elisa Rodriguez, and I am a member of ACE and the Keep LA House Coalition. I live in District 14, and I strongly support the proposed seven amendment to close some of the loopholes, especially the um, to require the landlords to participate in anti and the you into in the rental assistance programs. Um, I have been approved for six months of ULA assistance, and my landlord tells them he has no idea who I am, so I can't get the assistance that I have been approved for. My home has been broken into. My landlord tells the city employees from LAHD that I am trash, and I need help, and this would ordinance would very much not just help myself, but other people from being harassed. I am a rape survivor, domestic violence survivor. My landlord knows about all of this and continues to harass and has used my... Thank you for your time. Th thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, your name and the items you wish to speak on. And I'll call a couple more names. Um, I called Lucia Avat, Lupita Gonzalez, Maria Cabellon, and Edna Monroy. Um, your name? Hi. Hi. I'm Lupita Gonzalez. I'm the senior household organizer with ACE. I live in District A. I'm a tenant. Hi, Marquis. Okay. okay. I'm here uh, to talk about public comment. Mm -hmm. And then I. You have one minute. Go ahead. Okay. I support the seven amendments for the tenants anti harassment ordinance. Every day, tenants came to the office about some harassment. Mm -hmm. And we need to fix that situation because it's enough, it's enough to have this situation in the city of LA. They're supposed to be, we have uh, the ordinance, but that is not working. And please, Mr. Bob Bloomfield, support us and then everyone, uh, Mr. Lee, uh, Ms. Monica, please support this, uh, this situation to live in the better world. And thank you very much. And yeah, I forgot the city attorney. The city attorney needs to support us too. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, your name and the items you wish to speak on. And remember, I've called out Lucia, Edna, and Maria, Edna Monroy, Maria Caballon. Go ahead, your name and the items. Hola, buenos días. Yo voy a hacer comentario público y okay. sobre el artículo 7. Okay, so, um, y, y artículo 7? Yeah. Okay, so you have two minutes and you have to pause for the translator. Okay, okay, okay. go ahead. Um, buenas tardes, mi nombre es Lucía Abad. Soy Good afternoon, my name is Lucía Abad. De la coalición KPA Houses. Vivo en el distrito 9 y yo apoyo firmemente Las siete enmiendas so I am part of the Keep LA, Cows, uh, Keep LA cerrar, House Coalition, and I am here to uh, give the insurance support. So, so the the enmiendas. Enmiendas. Lucia, Ms. Avat, just, um, puede pa hay que pausar un, un momento. Adelante. Eh, yo vivo firmemente apoyar las enmiendas, las siete enmiendas, para cerrar las lagunas en las ordenanzas contra el acoso a los inquilinos. Que I'm, está here, I'm here to support the uh, seven amendments that are being proposed for the ordinance Tahoe. Puedo mencionar algunas, como es el acoso, refinir los, el, el acoso de, de, con acuerdos, definiciones y establecidas y más exitosas de otras jurisdicciones. Okay, some of the things that I would like to mention out of these uh, amendments is the definition of what harassment would be, well, identifying those aspects and then being able to work to prevent them. 
Una más es requerir la participación de los propietarios en programas de, asist de asistencia para el alquiler. Also, the requirement for our uh, property owners to participate in uh, rent assistant assistance programs. Mm -hmm. uh, señor concejal Bob Merfrio y la abogada municipal Heidi Firestone Soto, debemos y necesitamos su apoyo para aprobar y implementar las leyes de atajo. Porque yo en lo personal he sufrido. Ha llegado la propietaria. Yo hago. Yo hago un poco. So I, I'm here to also ask that uh, the councilman, uh, Mr. Leon and Hugo Soto, to also approve uh, for these amendments because personally I have suffered with the same uh, things that are listed in this amendment in this ordinance. En lo personal, mi caso es que yo entiendo un poco el inglés, pero no lo hablo del total. Personally, in my case, I understand a little bit of English, but I don't speak it fully. Un día llegó la dueña y se dirigió directamente a mi hijo, y mi hijo salió llorando. Dije, ¿por qué le permití la entrada a la dueña para que ofendiera a mi hijo? So there was a situation where the property owner entered into my home and uh, my child was crying, saying, why did you let her in? And this is one of the reasons that we should incorporate these amendments because uh, it helps us to prevent people from just simply entering into our homes. Necesitamos su apoyo para brindar una seguridad para inquilinos, para que no nos vayamos a las calles. And we need your support to be able to have that safety as tenants and to also be able to keep our streets safe and stay off of them. También necesitamos una ayuda para asegurar que la lauso tenga una fórmula justa para todos, porque yo en lo personal me están arreglando la casa Y tengo tres semanas sin trabajar porque llegan 20 minutos por aviso de la dueña que no pueden trabajar más. So, uh, this is also something that we need help with, or I personally need help with, is that uh, the, the, pro the property owner has come in and saying that they're going to do certain repairs, and I've lost three weeks worth of work because at the last minute she says she's going to come on another day. Muchas gracias, señores concejales. Esperemos que nosotros inquilinos nos apoyen. Gracias. Thank you so much, council members. I really appreciate your time, and I hope that I can get your support. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Okay, what items are you speaking well, about? Well, all the goddamn fucking items in general comment. Okay, you have... Three minutes, yes. two minutes for the items, one minute for general public yes. comment. Yes, thank you for starting my clock before I spoke. I think that's very good. Agent Civilli of the FBI, please note that overt act. What number? 409. <laughs> so number one is the Kevin DeLeon shove motion. This is something that Bob didn't even know about. Did you know, Bob, that Kevin is, is pushing out all this homeless out of CD 14 West? and giving them over to CD1, CD10, CD13. Did you know that? That's where all the new homeless are coming in. And then later they get tickets and they go down to CD3. And that's the reason Katie today decided to not meet with the terrorists, I mean the uh, homeless advocates, because she knows enough is enough. You got too many of them, and now she wants to push them back east, right? <laughs> as she eats her meal very, very hungry. Yum, 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 yum. <laughs> so that's what we're doing. L.A. Grand Hotel, owned by the Chinese government. <laughs> One of the former uh, co-defendants of Mr. Weezer uh, owns that hotel. So you're giving him government money. So that's really good. Giving a federal former government defendant for Mr. Weezer. Let's give you a hand. Very good. <laughs> Yes, yes, and it was all Marchese's idea, wasn't it? You're a genius. That's why you're known as Weezer 2.0 in some of the circles we frequent. Yes, keep up the good work. You know, Jose is only going to get out in 13 years, and he only has to do 80% of the sentence. It's not 
a small price to pay to become a millionaire, isn't it? <laughs> Money for nothing and your chicks for free. <laughs> now we get to the general comment. <laughs> yes, holding these goddamn meetings all at the same time yesterday, holding this meeting at 2.30 and the other one at 1.30, all for the inconvenience of one talking animal. <laughs> the whole city fucks up all these meetings because of me. Well, let's give you a hand for that. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. And that's what you call power. Nobody gives you power. Real power, Bob, is something you take. Now, of course, you think you have the power, but you've given me the power over you. So I'm going to leave here. And then you're going to be stuck here figuring out how to do all this shit with Judge Carter up your asshole and the FBI on the other side while I go home and have a snack and laugh my ass off on the freeway. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> and finally, we have to say that Tracy Park, that was an ugly jacket she wore today, and I hope she dresses better. Thank you so much. Next speaker, please. Uh, and I called Edna Monroy, Maria Cabellon, and let me also call Grace Hutt, Jackie Fournier, and John Malloy. Go ahead, your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hi, uh, my name is Maria Cabellon. Um, the public an announcement for number seven. So um, that, okay. For so wreck the troll. So you have one, one minute for item seven. Okay, for item seven, yes. Yeah. Okay, Sorry. Great. No, no, that's okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Maria Cabellion. I am a member of, a of ACCE of ACE and the Keep and the Keep LA House Co Coalition. I live in District 8. Um, I strongly support the seven proposed amendments to close loopholes in the tenant anti-harassment ordinance Tahoe. Number two, amendment to reform of abusive right of entry practices. Um, Council member Bob Blumingfield and city attorney Heidi uh, felt this thing sort of since the, pa the passage of the tenant anti-harassment ordinance in August, 2021. It has been nearly impossible to use the ordinance to stop harassment. I have experienced harassment by the landlord through. Sorry, your time is up. Thank you for your testimony. Okay. And I um, apologize for mispronouncing your last name. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate Thank you very much. Next speaker. Your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hi, I'm Edna Monroy with SAGE and Keep LA House Coalition. I'm here to speak on general public comment and support of Tahoe. Okay, so you have one minute. Thank you. So uh, I first and foremost wanna thank Council Member Nithya Raman and call on the support of all electeds, uh, including my council member Heather Hutt, District 10, uh, District 3, Bob Lumingfield, and the city attorney. We need all seven amendments for a stronger Tahoe and we need a st stronger Tahoe to keep tenants housed and protected. We can't have one without the other. And so we need a stronger Tahoe to ensure that no more Angelinos become unhoused, victims of landlord harassment, intimidation, as well as mental, physical, and psychological abuse. We need to redefine the definition of harassment and we need to ensure that the housing department does our job to ensure that tenants are protected. And so I call on the electeds to support us to make this happen this year, 2024. When we passed Tahoe three years ago, we knew that was not the end. And so that's why we're here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, your name and the items you wish to speak on. And I've so far called Grace Hutt, Jackie Fournier, John Malloy, Go ahead, your name. Hi, my name is Grace Hutt. I'm with, the, I'm with Strategic Actions for a Just Economy, here to speak on item number seven. Okay, you have one minute. Thank you. 
I'm here with SAGE to express my strong support for the recommendations outlined in LAHD's report back on Ellis Act evictions. Without interference, the Barrington Plaza evictions could set a dangerous precedent of landlords using the Ellis Act to evict rent-stabilized tenants for renovation work that should instead trigger the Tenant Habitability Program. Properly enforcing the THP and preventing evictions for renovation work is especially urgently important given the city's building decarbonization efforts, which will require to landlords to make energy efficiency upgrades to their units. However, even when enforced properly, the THP only protects rent-stabilized tenants. This leaves 25% of the city's renters vulnerable to decarbonization-related displacement due to a loophole in local law that allows evictions for substantial remodels. If the city is serious about equitably decarbonizing our building stock, then we must prevent all tenants from evictions for renovation work by both preventing bad faith Ellis Act evictions and closing the substantial remodel eviction loophole. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, and I'll call a couple of other speakers, Phoebe Valencia, Robert Lawrence, and Sonia Verdugo. Welcome. Your name and the items you wish to speak on? My name is John Malloy, and I'm uh, speaking on item number five, the, uh, the uh, carryover uh, motion to uh, approve the uh, funds for the housing units that are going to be built. Okay. You have one minute. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to speak in favor of the motion. Uh, I'm a part of the nonprofit that is developing these units there, and uh, we, we really welcome the, uh, the opportunity to participate with the ULA folks on this, and uh, I'm just a big supporter of it. Great. Is that, is that your entire comment? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. We appreciate your feedback. Next speaker. Um, your name and the items you wish to speak on? Hi, my name is Jackie Fournier. I wish to speak on items seven and eight. Okay, you have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Jackie Fournier and I'm a tenant at Barrington Plaza Apartments. For the last 11 months, the tenants at our Barrington Plaza have been fighting on our own for our homes with no help from the city and especially no help from our councilwoman Tracy Park or Mary Bass. We are not only fighting Douglas Emmett, but we feel like we have been fighting LEHD and a city attorney who has done nothing to question the motives. Absolutely no action has been taken from LEHD until recently. No monthly updates as requested last June until recently when they developed suggestive changes to the Ellis Act. Barrington Plaza is a case study in what not to do. When a city council, when a city official signed off on renovation plans six weeks before a mass eviction, those evictions were in bad faith based on the Ellis Act. No one looked into this or questioned it. That was the smoking gun that council members asked about to LEHD last September. How far does this need to go before action is taken at city council? You all say, not my backyard, not my problem. Well, your backyard is all of Los Angeles. Councilwoman Rahman, Douglas Emmett tried to get into your backyard. Who is next? When a developer is trying to buy the city and shows you who they are, believe them. There are two numerous examples of Jordan Kaplan and Douglas Emmett donating to campaigns in, for favors, including county efforts and tax assessors, the city attorney, and Tracy Park, just to name a few. When Tracy Park says she and her office has helped Barrington Plaza tenants, that is a blatant lie. They have done nothing. She's beholden to Douglas Emmett because of over $1 million have been donated to her campaign received by Douglas Emmett, their employees and associates, and this is according to the LA Ethics Commission. Barrington Plaza Tenants Association has spent numerous hours helping our tenants between phone calls, emails, paperwork, and holding hands when mourning a loved one who has died in this whole process and who have quelled mental health issues that mass unlawful evictions have affected. Thank you, Ms. Fournier. Your time is up. Do you want one more minute for general public comment? Yes. I'm okay. almost done. Please continue. Thank you. Taking 770 RSO units off the rental market for renovation is unjustifiable, complicit to homelessness, abhorrent, and anyone in a city that is complicit in this action will be ultimately held accountable. So in conclusion, we will keep fighting not only for Barrington Plaza, but we are fighting for all of L.A. because we know this is bigger than us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. And I'll call uh, Mickey Goral, uh, Monique Gomez, 
I've also already called Phoebe Valencia, Robert Lawrence, and Sonia Verdugo. Go ahead. Your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Ogi Toscano y soy miembro de SAGE, eh, junto con la coalición Keep LA House. Y okay. vivo en el Distrito 10. Estoy aquí para hablar de la, de, um, comentario público general. Okay. Hi, my name is you have one minute, and I'm going to ask that you pause. Y también del asunto 7. Okay, so you have two minutes, okay. and you need to pause for the translation. Okay. Hi, my name Go is Augie Toscano. I'm representing District 10. I'm, I am a part of SAGE and Keep um, LA. And I'm going to talk about um, general comment and also number seven in the agenda. Sí, bueno, estoy aquí para apoyar este, las siete enmiendas que se han propuesto. I'm here to, uh, in support of the seven amendments that have been proposed. Para enforzar el, la ordenanza Tajo. To enforce the Tajo ordinance. Ya que actualmente pues no tiene ninguna efectividad y no nos está ayudando para nada. Because right now it's not effective and it's not helping us in any way. Concejal Nitia Raman, yo le agradezco mucho por apoyarnos en este, en este asunto de las siete enmiendas. Pero también me gustaría pedirle el compromiso a todos los demás concejales y especialmente a Bloomingfield y el, y el abogado de la ciudad. Um, I, um, Councilman uh, Nithi Ramos, thank you for your support. Uh, but I also would like, you know, to ask the other council members, especially Bloomingfield and also to the district attorney, to compromise with us. Por favor, comprometanse porque esto es algo muy necesario y muy ur urgente. Please, compromise with us because this is very important and this is a very urgent matter. Uh, Diario se está escuchando de historias de muchas personas que están sufriendo acoso, incluido yo. Uh, we have always, I mean, every day you hear stories of people that has been uh, harassed and, and me included. Actualmente yo tengo un, un caso que sometí al Departamento de Vivienda de aumento ilegal de renta. Uh, I'm, right now, I'm fighting a case that I, um, I submitted to the housing department uh, related to my rent. Housing department ya dictaminó a mi favor, pero el dueño se, se niega a respetar. Housing department already, you know, acted on my favor, but um, the owner of the apartment is not enforcing what they have said. Yo quiero saber qué es lo que está pasando con los dueños. ¿Por qué no quieren respetar? ¿Por qué uno tiene que respetar y ellos no respetan? I would like to know what's happening to landlords. I mean, they don't respect us. I mean, I want to know what's happening, what's going on with them. Y eso también va junto con uh, el control de renta, que tengamos este, algo justo, algo que no sea demasiado exagerado, porque entonces este, no, no podremos... No tendremos la capacidad para un aumento demasiado exagerado. And that also goes hand in hand with rent control. Uh, we want something that is fair, not too high, so we're able to pay it. Y nuevamente les digo a todos los concejales que, por favor, comprometanse en serio. Esto no es un juego. Uh, el acoso está pasando todos los días y necesitamos algo para defendernos. And I would like to, I mean, repeat it again. Please, council members, please make a commitment with us because harassment is a real thing that is happening every day. Si no, de otra manera, entonces vamos a ver más, más desalojos y más uh, gente desamparada en las calles. Because in, if it's not acted, uh, we're going to keep on seeing more people being evicted and living in the streets. Yo creo que es algo que no quieren ustedes, ¿verdad? No, no queremos ver a más gente en la calle, ¿verdad? I don't think you want more homeless people, you know in the streets. Es todo. Muchas gracias. That's, That's it. Nice. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. And these are the last speakers. Phoebe Valencia, Robert Lawrence, Sonia Verdugo, Mickey Goral, and Monique Gomez. And with those, we'll com conclude your um, name I'm, and the I'm items. speaking on seven and eight. Okay, so you have so, two minutes. Well, I have two minutes, okay. Um, hi, my name is Robert Lawrence. Uh, thanks for holding this long overdue hearing on Barrington Plaza. I've been a resident there for almost three years. I'm a writer-producer. One of my credits is clueless, which is appropriate given that many of my fellow tenants and I are totally clueless as to why the city and our councilwoman, Tracy Park, has done nothing to fight our eviction given that affordable housing and homelessness is one of the biggest problems our city is facing. Last July, shortly after our eviction, I wrote an article for the op-ed page of the Los Angeles Times about the hardships the largest evic eviction since Chavez Ravine has caused me and so many of my fellow residents. I also wrote a piece several weeks ago for LA Progressive in which I referenced a ragtag group of remaining tenants who call ourselves the holdouts. 
We are not only a multiracial, multi-ethnic, working-class community, but a tightly knit family who have come together to fight our eviction. Among them are longtime paraplegic residents suffering from ALS who hope to live out her final year at Barrington Plaza, the 80-year-old fairy dog mother of BP and what used to be our dog park, until Douglas Emmett, our multi-billion dollar corporate landlord, closed it for no reason, and who now treats her loneliness at a local bar. A PTSD-afflicted woman suffering from the anxiety and stress caused by her eviction, and a pair of elderly, disabled, identical twins with matching walkers and UCLA Bruin t-shirts, one of whom recently died from the stress. I only mention them because I want you to know that we are not faceless tenants of Barrington Plaza. Many of us have lived here for decades, and we, res we deserve your support in staying in our homes as housing is a basic human right. I'm asking for your help in fighting Douglas Emmett's unlawful use of the Ellis Act. They have donated hundreds of thousands of dollars in brazen influence pending to campaign for Tracy Park. Uh, they have already named our, our apartment complex the Landmark Plaza next to the luxury building next door. It is why they reject our desperate plea to implement the Hata Tenant Habitability Act. Could their legal domestic mercenary agenda be any more transparent? Please don't be complicit in their corporate greed and the mass eviction of our constituents. Please help the holdouts. Thank you. I'd also like to give a shout out to the Coalition for Economic Survival for their help. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hi, my name is Sonia Verdugo and I'm speaking on item number seven. Okay, you have one minute. Okay, um, I am a member of Ground Game and Keep LA House, the Keep LA House Coalition and I live in District 8. I strongly support the seven proposed amendments to close loopholes in the tenant anti-harassment ordinance. Um, mainly for me, redefining the harassment in line with established and more successful definitions of, the dur of other jurisdictions. Council Member Bob Blumenfeld and City Attorney Heidi Fieldstein Soto, since the passage of the Tenant Anti-Harassment Ordinance in August of 2021, it has been nearly impossible to use the ordinance to stop harassment. We need the seven new amendments so that tenants can defend themselves or ourselves and remain in our homes in peace. We need your support. Please commit to championing all of Tenant or Tahoe 2.0, and we also need a just permanent Larso rent cap. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your testimony. Next speaker, your name and the items you're speaking on. Our final speakers once again are Phoebe Valencia, Mickey Goral, and Monique Gomez. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Phoebe Valencia. Um, I'm a member of Ground Game LA. And what items are you speaking on? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, mm. um, item six. Item six. You have one minute. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, my name is Phoebe Valencia. I'm a member of Ground Game LA and the Keep LA Housed Coalition. I live in District 8, and I strongly support the seven proposed amendments to close loopholes in the Tenant Anti-Harassment Ordinance. <clears throat> we need the seven new amendments so that tenants can defend ourselves and remain in our homes in peace. We need your support. Please commit to championing all the Tahoe 2.0, and we, we also need a just permanent Larso rent cap. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, your name and the items you wish to speak on. My name is Mickey Gorell, and I'm speaking on item seven. Okay, I you have a, one minute, go okay. ahead. I'm a 34-year tenant of the Barrington Plaza. I support all of the speakers who've gone before speaking on the Barrington Plaza issue and the illegal use of the Ellis Act. I would like to just comment that the fact is that we are in affordable housing, and I read the LA Times, I still get the paper, printed paper supporting the press, and they have articles every day about homelessness and the problems of affordable housing. We have it and we need to keep it. And the Ellis Act is being used illegally to try to deplete that market. And I urge the city council to do whatever it can and the city attorney and mayor to do whatever they can to support us in keeping our homes. We do not want to be homeless. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And our final speaker, Monique Gomez. What items are you speaking on today? Seven, eight, and general. Okay, you have two minutes for the items and one minute for general. Okay, it's all kind of together, but good afternoon. My name is Monique Gomez, and I played a role in establishing the Barrington Plaza Tenants Association, also known as BPTA. My focus is on the legal aspect, administration, and operations of the association. Although I would like to take you through the last 11 months of our lives within the walls of Barrington Plaza, 
I want to shed light on the disorderly and of many processes surrounding our Ellis Act eviction. Let's start with the E2 form that Douglas Emmett filed with LAHD on May 8, 2023. At a council meeting on June 6, 2023, Anna Ortega with LAHD highlighted that these filings, also known as Notice of Intent to Withdraw Units, are not approved but rather accepted according to local and state law. Fast forward to July 7th, the deadline for tenants to submit their notice to landlord to extend their tenancy. Again, the word notice is key here. These notices are not approved, but merely accepted. <coughs> Following this deadline, Douglas Emmett issued an E-5 form to tenants who submitted extensions on, on, on time, granting them a new withdrawal date of May 2024. These executed, they executed this form under penalty and perjury that the information provided was accurate. This understandably led tenants to believe they had an extended stay until May 2024. However, just before the scheduled move out, Douglas Emmett reversed its decision demanding proof of disability from tenants who had already submitted their extensions on time. This demand for medical records or doctor's notes was unreasonable given the short time frame provided, and especially after tenants had already received a signed E-5 form confirming their extended stay. I had a meeting on August 5th with Anna Ortega and her team via Zoom where we discussed these issues and sought, and sought assistance in securing tenants' rights to stay, on August 30th, we received a list of approved tenants from LAHD based on the documentation provided. However, it wasn't until September 20th, okay, you guys get that, September 20th. We were supposed to be out September 5th. 15 days past the move out deadline that we were informed all tenants who submitted an extension notice were finally approved regardless of whether they had submitted their medical documentation. Unfortunately, by then, many of our disabled tenants had already vacated. And while LAHD made efforts, at least more than Tracy Park did, um, more could have been done, particularly early in the process. My question is, why were tenants required to provide proof of disability for their notice, whereas Douglas Emmett did not provide any similar documentation for theirs? This is not fair. And this process was undeniably messy, representing only a fraction of the challenges we have endured. I, Am I done? Yeah, your time okay. is up. We appreciate Thank your testimony. You. Thank you very much. Thank you and very much. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'd like to conclude public comment. We've taken thir more than 35 minutes of public comment, and I want to thank everyone who came to speak today. At this time, I'm going to recommend a few items that we take on consent from the agenda. Um, at minimum, I'd like to suggest that we take items 5 and 8 through 10 on consent, and I know that there's questions um, on item 4 that we'd like to hear and questions on the other items. 5 and 8 through 10, is that fine? Okay, seeing no objections. Um, for item 5, I want to specify that we'll file the LAHG report and approve the revised CAO report. And seeing no objections, uh, Mr. Rahman, can you please call the roll? Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Bloomfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. <coughs> aye. Five ayes, and these items are approved. Thank you very much. So let's take item seven first. Um, if you could read that item into the record. Item number seven is a Los Angeles Housing Department report relative to evictions under the Ellis Act and the feasibility of amending the rent stabilization ordinance and establishing a bad actor policy to prevent bad faith evictions and related matters. Okay, we have Anna Ortega and Emma Garcia here from LAHD, I believe, and Joel Williams from DBS for this item. Um, and I'm grateful to all of you for being here today. Mr. Good, are you gonna be joining us as well? No, you're not, okay. Um, and I think, we heard today's testimony from so many tenants uh, at Barrington Plaza about some of the challenges that they have faced through this process. Uh, and this motion asked LAHD, DBS, and other city departments to get a better handle on the interaction between Ellis um, and other tools that we have locally, like a, the tenant habitability plan, um, and really suggest some changes in the way in which we handle this process uh, and ways in which we can amend the RSO 
to ensure that some of the issues that we've been hearing about can be addressed. So with that, I want to turn it over to Ms. Ortega uh, to summarize your study and um, your recommendations. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council Persons. Anna Ortega, Assistant General Manager, LA Housing Department. Um, as you know, the Ellis Act is a state law that disallows jurisdictions from preventing landlords from going out of the rental housing business. The law was actually passed in 1985. The city didn't adopt our own Ellis provisions until 2006, mm. so 20 years later. Um, but it does provide certain provisions and requirements in order for landlords to go out of the rental housing market right. that, that don't exist otherwise. They, they require notice, a minimum of 120 days notice with an opportunity for tenants um, who are seniors or disabled to request a year's notice. And they also, it also requires the right to return if the um, housing is put back on the housing market. So it does provide certain protections for tenants. Nevertheless, um, it's been a controversial process for the entire time that we've had this law. And the city has tried to tighten enforcement, strengthen enforcement, and close loopholes. We've amended the law several times, including in 2007, twice in 2017, and most recently in 2020. The review of the Barrington situation, as well as other work that we, our staff has in processing these withdrawals has led to a number of recommendations that are before you today. So they fall into four categories. The first is, again, Ellis is a state law, and we believe that some strengthening requires amendment at the state level. Hmm. Therefore, recommendation one is um, that the LHD work with the mayor and C chief legislative analyst to support legislative changes that would do the following. Require one-year extensions for all tenants if there is at least one unit that uh, is eligible for a one-year extension. In the case of the Barrington, there were 577 occupied units. There were eventually 138 that were granted one-year extensions. And it really is hard to understand if 138 people were staying, why everyone else couldn't stay as well. It doesn't provide, it doesn't change anything for the landlord. They, they can't proceed with the work when there's occupied units. The second is to, um, that the Ellis Act should explicitly, explicitly allow cities to regulate the initial rent for the first 10 years after re-rental in order to conform with the tenant's right to return within 10 years. Right now, that is unclear about whether tenants have the right to return at their old rent. It, uh, one interpretation is that they only have it up for the first five years. The third recommendation at the state level is to require that um, property owners list an intended future use of the property instead of uh, undecided. Uh, so those were three um, changes that the city should advocate for at the state level. We have a number of other items um, that we think are feasible, but at this time we're recommending that LHD be instructed to work with the city attorney and report back on four items. One is to require, That's also right. at the city level, require owners to state the in, uh, in intended future use of the building. B is to add a financial, policy, uh, financial penalty for demolishing an RSO unit without filing the required forms. We actually appear to have this authority now, but we, what we don't have is what the penalty fee should be. So we can come back and report back on what that penalty should be. Third is to add a financial penalty for failure to file the annual status reports, which um, landlords are required to file after they've executed an analysis withdrawal. And fourth is to deny our sub exemptions for newly constructed units built subsequent to an illegal demolition done without the Ellis or without demolition permits. So again, these are all examples of loopholes that we see that the, that the city may be able to address through further amendments. 
Um, our last recommendation is that um, the Department of Building and Safety and LHD report back on the feasibility of establishing a bad actor policy whereby owners would be unable to obtain permits for new projects if there is a record of unresolved citations, orders to comply, or violations at an existing property, including demolitions of existing RSO units without complying with the RSO provision. So basically, uh, to report back on the feasibility of a bad actor policy when there's noncompliance. Our fourth category is a number of recommendations, six recommendations, where we believe the RSO should be amended. And Ms. Garcia, who is the Assistant Director of Rent Stabilization, will review those, those uh, recommendations for amendments of the RSO. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank um, you. And before you start speaking, may I request that you pull the microphone close to you so that we can hear every word. Thank you. Yes. Um, so the following are the six recommendations that we have for amendments to the RSO that we believe, believe can be drafted. Um, number one is to disallow the approval for permits for primary renovation work that requires the filing of a THP while an, an LS withdrawal has been filed and tenants continue to reside at the property or have been temporarily relocated. Number two, to establish an administrative appeal process for tenants who claim extended tenancies under the Ellis Act. Number three, to codify that the extension of tenancies beyond one year do not change the withdrawal date of the property and clarify that longer extensions are not a re-rental in conformance with state law. We believe that this particular change would encourage landlords to allow longer periods of time for tenants to remain in the unit before they have to move out. Number four is to clearly state that the payment of punitive damages to a tenant shall not be construed to ex extinguish the owner's obligation to comply with the re-rental um, requirements or re-rental obligations under the law, which are in conformance with state law. Number five is to require that landlords may either pay relocation directly to the tenant or deposit the relocation into an escrow account within a minimum um, of 15 days, and the amount should be the minimum amount required for an eligible tenant. Subsequently, if it is determined that the tenant is entitled to a higher relocation amount, the owner should be uh, required to provide the additional funds within 15 days of that determination. And number six, and, and the last recommendation, is to provide the tenants evicted in order to comply with a government order, have a right to return to the same unit and at the same rent rate that they were paying, plus annual allowable RSO increases, if the violation cited in the government order is remedied and the unit is made habitable again. Thank you. So that is a summary of uh, our recommended four categories of recommendations, and we are available for any questions or clarifications. Thank you very much for your report. I want to open up to the rest of the committee for questions at this time. Any questions from committee members? Mr. Lee. Well, I support this item going through. I just want to make sure that as our region continues to deal with the housing uh, crisis, I want the city to make sure that we are purposeful in our policymaking decisions and not make it harder and more expensive to recycle our housing stock. Our housing stock is just getting older here in the city of Los Angeles. And I just want to make sure that, you know, in the recent years, state has incentivized uh, us to be able to, you know, have greater density, you know, within within our areas. And I just want to make sure that as our city's housing stock continues uh, to age, this body ensure that the property owners can make use of those incentives and increase um, and update our housing stock. So just just really asking to make sure, like, I just want to make sure our, our housing stock is aging. And I just want to make sure that we are not limiting ourselves to provide more housing stock I know this is maybe separate than what we're talking about, but just want to make sure the housing department is purposeful in, in thinking about that as we move forward. Um, if I may, Councilman, the Ellis Act as currently employed does allow that. 
uh, and there's a dashboard actually on our website that shows uh, all of the L units removed through the LSAC and the replacement units that have been built there. I believe it's like four to one. So many more units are, have been built where units have been removed through the Ellis provision. So there's nothing in any of these recommendations that would, that would impede landlords from, from I have, I have no issues with converting. The today. I have no issues with the amendments uh -huh. today. Great, thank you so much. Any other questions, Mr. Lee? I'm, I think the thing, you know, Mr. Lee and I were discussing this in advance of the meeting um, while we were waiting for other members to, to come in. And one of the concerns that we both flagged, which I think is really important, which is what happens for residents in older buildings um, where the costs of rent are lower because residents have been living there for a long time but there are real habitability issues for which the landlord needs to make what are now very, very expensive investments um, given the cost of construction and given the cost of labor. Um, and I think that's something that our city needs to take on uh, with more thoughtfulness and uh, has generated a number of issues in our district. I think we have to be able to support landlords in order to resolve habitability issues. I don't think it's related to this particular work but I think it's just an important issue for us to consider as we move through what I think will be a very tough period for older buildings that are very expensive to do repairs in, um, to ensure that tenants have the best possible spaces where they can live and to ensure that landlords are able to do that work. So I look forward to addressing that issue. That's a separate issue, but was brought up by Mr. Lee's questions. Any other questions from committee members on this? Ms. Rodriguez, go ahead. Yeah, and I, so, a few years ago, several years ago, there was an effort by Mayor Garcetti to discuss uh, retrofits of, uh, you know, structural deficiencies for earthquake resiliency uh, for a number of our uh, apartment units. We've got a lot of aged housing stock. Um, what, I, I don't know how many of those remain, but what are the circumstances that could then prompt, for example, I mean, those are very concerning uh, units of housing stock. How might LSB utilized in those circumstances, and I don't even know how many still remain. I, I don't recall what the number was. Actually, Greg probably remembers, but I, I, I know it's a lot. Yeah, thanks, Greg. <laughs> thanks, Greg, for the technical answer. Uh, so I, but I remember there was a substantial number, and I'm just wondering what the, how we're kind of considering that. Uh, right. in so this that context. is not Ellis. It, it would be something that might require a THP. I, uh, we did work extensively on the seismic retrofit several years ago, and there was a timeline by which um, the work was supposed to be done. It was kind of phased in, and right. it was a total seven-year process. We're towards the tail end of that seven-year. Um, the lucky thing about the seismic retrofit is that a lot of that work is actually, it was done in the dingbat buildings with, um, with the, the, st the stilts. Right, the stilts. So mm -hmm. the good thing about that was that it, the work to retrofit it mainly required um, work in the parking area. Got it. And so it was not that disruptive internally in, the, in tenants' units. Uh, it might have perhaps required the removal of one or two parking spaces, which okay. would have required a reduction in rent for the affected tenants, but it didn't really affect the habitability. And at the time, the council adopted uh, measures to govern the allowable rent increase mm -hmm. um, to tenants for doing that work. Right. So our staff is involved on the code side in um, doing a THP, but it's a modified THP because as I mentioned, it's not that extensive. And our other staff in the rent division has been working on approving rent increases for, um, for tenants for that common area work. So that work is actually ongoing. We could provide more information on just where we are and how many in the numbers to your staff or in a future report. Yeah, that would be great. And I, again, I remember it was cost prohibitive for a lot of the buildings uh, and, you know, these are the circumstances that everyone has to be mindful of is that there's not infinite amounts of money for people to expend in those retrofits as well. And so the cost recovery and how, how they manage all of those things 
frankly, it's still a health and safety issue long term because we want to incent and create an opportunity for these property owners to get these properties into more structurally sound conditions. Uh, you know, look, we just saw the 7.5 event in Taiwan. Uh, it's not dissimilar to what we saw in Northridge. And so, you know, again, we just always have to keep that top, you know, top of mind that um, tenants and, you know, everyone just needs to be mindful that the resources aren't there for the retrofits, uh, you know, financial support for, towards these retrofits, but it is a life and death situation that they have to be mindful of and everyone plays a role in that. And so we just have to, un we have to recognize the dynamics of, uh, of these circumstances, but I was just curious if Ellis would play into that, but thank you, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez, thank you. Um, seeing no other comments from the committee, I'm going to move that we um, move this, these recommendations forward to the rest of the council. Uh, and I just wanted to ask one quick question. The wording of instructions two and three are slightly amendment, uh, slightly different. So I wanna confirm that the draft amendments and the report on the feasibility of amending the RSO will both come back to committee and then go to council, right? For, for instructions two and three? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so uh, can you call the roll on this? Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Bloomingfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Aye. Five ayes, and this item is approved. Okay, great. Um, at this time, I'd like to take up, uh, let's see. Let's do item six, which is a citywide outreach matrix. Mr. Verano, can you read this item into the record? Item number six is a homeless strategy committee report relative to the citywide outreach matrix identifying and outlining the functions of homelessness related outreach teams in the city. So this item, you know, I wanna thank the CIO staff um, for uh, completing the request for information on this. Um, I think for me, this was useful because I think it gives us a point from which to make changes as we move through the budget process. And it indicates that we have work ahead to, to be done. I don't, I think this, what you've provided is informational and should be treated as such by the committee with the assumption that we will be making changes to the outreach process in the city going forward. So with that, I wanna turn it over to both of you for your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Mindy Potongsenen with the Office of the CAO. Before you today is a citywide outreach matrix report. This chart was previously provided as part of the 23-24 proposed budget memo. This chart has been updated from the Homeless Strategy Committee about two weeks ago for, mm -hmm. to reflect any mid-year contract execution and contracts held by city clerk that are funded with council district discretionary funds. Additionally, we revised the attachment to include the number of teams, the number of FTEs per team, and the geographical areas they serve. Uh, this concludes my presentation at this time. We are also joined, but we also have our LASA colleagues here available to answer any questions as well. Thank you for your time. Great, anything else, Mr. Gibson? Okay, I had an opportunity to kind of interrogate this table in, the, in, um, in another forum, so I just wanna open it up to other committee members if they had questions. Mr. Bloomingfield. And um, I would love to, if we can, do one question at a time if there's a lot of questions. I don't have a lot of questions. Great. Um, Go ahead. The, what's it going to take to get make sure the circle teams have access to housing resources and other services, given we're spending so much on, on outreach programs? How can we make sure the outreach teams that are out there are actually better equipped and effective? Is that a LASA question or a CAO question? I kind of feel, Ed Gibson, CAO's office, thank Great, you. Great, go ahead. I, I kind of feel like it is a hybrid question, if you will. Um, we, we do have a good number of the folks at LASA who are on the ground, but we have other service providers. I think it comes down to a, a key conversation about resources and the distri distribution of resources. We know there's uh, only so many dollars available that are being spread around, and I think part of the reason that we have updated this citywide matrix is taking a look at the, the the number of outreach available that's out there, and then the conversation that you comment you just brought up is what are the resources at hand? Mm -hmm. They need to better align. And part of this conversation and updating this chart is to help it better align. Um, I think when we start to take a look at how many we're reaching out to, I'll defer to Lassa on that, but um, 
trying to align what the resources are with those teams because right now most of those teams do not have resources so um, it makes it challenging to have this much outreach going on if they're not resourced uh, in the appropriate way and then how those resources are being distributed is definitely a, yes. a LASA question. And we have uh, Mr. Vergao joining us from LASA. I don't know if you wanted to provide an additional answer to that question of, on circle teams specifically and how they can be provided the same resources as other outreach teams. Good afternoon, yes. Uh, thanks for having me. Nathaniel Vergao, Deputy Chief Program Officer for LASA. So uh, the circle team does have the same access to resources as, as any outreach team. Uh, we uh, invite them to uh, our case conferencing uh, resources for uh, outreach teams to ensure that they have the same information about um, resources. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, additionally, the, they would have the same access in terms of referral into uh, shelter beds across the city, uh, frankly across the county, as, as any outreach team. Um, and it is primarily through the shelter system that most folks access permanent housing, but there is there are um, avenues to access uh, um, permanent housing outside of the shelter system that includes the time limited subsidies as well as permanent supportive housing. So they they are a participating agency in the HMIS and would be able to enter their services in HMIS and ensure that their clients are entered in the homeless management information system. Uh, and uh, eligible to be connected to any of the resources, as well as referrals made directly through the system. You're saying if, if they attend these case conferencing meetings, does so that, they have to attend case conferencing meetings to get access? No, 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 no. That is an additional mechanism for flagging specific clients. If they have questions about specific clients, uh, the, those are opportunities to flag uh, clients. We, we use those um, uh, outreach coordination case conferencing meetings for all the outreach teams to discuss clients that they may be having difficulty connecting to specific resources uh, and ensuring that they're, uh, we have uh, so close collaboration between our county partners and, uh, and the outreach teams to, to have access to those resources. So all, all these different outreach teams that are out there, they all have to be funneled through LASA in order to have uh, access to the housing resources? No, they don't. So. Uh, well, when you say funnel through, through LASA, I'm not sure what you mean. Let me clarify that. Well, I'm saying they, they can't independently go to the, where, they, where the housing opportunities are. They have to go through LASA to get into the system, and you know, there's no, an outreach team can't more directly get somebody placed. So yes, they can. They can, the, uh, any outreach team can do the navigation work themselves. They can help. Uh, uh, participants identify uh, available units. They can uh, then make a referral directly to uh, the time loaded subsidy programs uh, to be able to assist in, in getting them the rental support and, and uh, uh, case management services for stabilization in that unit. Uh, so that is, there's not a need to go through LASA specifically, but those programs are funded through LASA. Right, I guess just trying to understand how it's all working so we can better direct you know, who gets access to the housing resources and how that happens, because it seems, it, it never seems to add up. I mean, in terms of the different outreach teams seem to have different ways of, of getting in, but I hear what you're saying. You're saying they all just, they all have the equal access. But, all right, I can yeah, go back to Thank you, I appreciate that question. And I think what, what became clear to me looking through this, so I think, you know, in this report, what it's showing is we're spending $47 million annually on outreach in the city um, with at least just from this table alone, and there's seven categories without the numbers of full-time employees per team, at least 136 employees, um, full-time employees working, doing outreach. There, I think, no matter how you are deploying these outreach workers, ultimately we have to figure out how they are able to move people off the streets into shelter. And I understand that they're limited by the number of shelter beds that we have available, but there are also vacancies in some of our shelter beds across our entire system. There are also vacancies in our housing units across the entire system. And so I think what to me this matrix tells me is we need to do a lot more coordination, particularly within geographic areas, to make sure we are driving towards those goals and driving towards outcomes as much as possible. And taking people who are superfluous in this, um, in, in particular geographic areas, and potentially putting them into areas where they are much needed. 
Um, so with that, I want to turn it over to Ms. Rodriguez for her questions. But Thank I think you. that's a great that's line fine. of questioning and really important for us to be able to look at as we move forward in assessing this system. Thank Go ahead, you. Ms. Rodriguez. Well, I, I, you know, First of all, I want to acknowledge what Mr. Blumenfield was just kind of teeing up, and, and thank you, Ms. Rahman. Uh, the, just let's, let's do top lines on this. $47.4 million, a ton of redundancies. By the way, we're not even talking about whatever the county is deploying under uh, their funded efforts in, in Measure H. So we're, again, reflecting that we when Everyone's in charge, no one's in charge. We've got no direct outcomes associated with each one of these operations. I will say even with the 18 field interventionists that have been funded, that's one point nine, oh, nearly $2 million funded in the mayor's office for their own independent outreach teams associated with, uh, with Inside Safe. And yet I'll, I'll, you know, my experience was Inside Safe outreach operations at the most recent uh, deployment had a contracted uh, outreach team with uh, Hope of the Mission. So I'm really having a hard time trying to ascertain who's on first. And there's a lot of redundancies, a lot of expenditures, a lot of contracts and staffing dedicated to outreach, and yet we cannot measure what are the placements. And if everyone has access and everyone can, if everyone supersedes one another, how do you actually get placements? It's, it's impossible. But everyone is standing up both with their uh, GCP funded, budget funded, LASA funded. Uh, of course, some of these very same service providers, I, I just want to lay it out there for everyone to understand. Some of these very same service providers are contracted whether, again, like I discovered with InsideSafe, or through Measure H from the county, and they won't give us any data about what their outreach entails because they're contracted to the county, so they're not obligated to tell us. Uh, we've got the HET teams. We've got just, again, we are outreach rich and housing poor. And if everyone has access through HMIS to be able to identify okay, there's a facility over here that perhaps we can place somebody. How do you know that three other agencies or three other outreach teams, I mean, it is ridiculous. It just makes absolutely no sense. And there's so many redundancies built into this because everybody wants to be in the outreach business, but no one wants to be in the placement of these individuals' business. And that's what we're all talking about, $47.4 million just on our books. I'd love to know what the total cost of outreach is for the entirety of the system that is supposed to be servicing the residents in Los Angeles. And this is where I've talked about previously about the duplication or frankly, the triplicate expenditures that still don't net us any gains in the placements of these individuals. So. Um, I appreciated this report. I know I asked for this, I, you know, various forms, various times, over and over and over again, and you know, we can never still get to the, the finality of what is it actually resulting in. But what this clearly showed me is the redundancies in the expenditures to do outreach. You can't track where uh, where the resources are actually being deployed, I mean, from circle and everything. I mean, again, you've got multiple layers addressing multiple, you know, similar areas and overlap. Um, lots of contracts, still no greater clarity, and still people on the streets. We've got the same deployment of outreach work going into the same locations and the same encampments many times that are either getting resolved and repopulated or not seeing any progress. And so it's just, you know, to me this only is, you know, shows more of the five alarm fire that we've got with respect to the expenditures made uh, and, and resources dedicated to outreach with no greater transparency or accountability for such. So, um, you know, again, I, I'm just, I'm really curious about the, the you know, again, the $2 million uh, that are associated with Inside Safe because again, I'm also 
what I saw was Hope of the Mission was involved in doing the outreach of that operation, but there's just a lot of redundancies from LASA to the, con to the spa leads, to all the different service providers, to those that are contracted by council offices. There's just a lot of money out there in outreach and not a lot of people getting served. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. And um, I think a lot of people around this horseshoe right now shared those concerns and I appreciate you um, highlighting them uh, so vividly. Uh, I think the next step is really to think about how we reduce those redundancies and looking at this outreach matrix. And I think the matrix gives us an opportunity to do that. Um, there, and I think it also gives us an opportunity to make the jobs better for the people doing outreach because for a lot of people who are out there doing outreach, they don't have a place to send people. And so they end up going out there, they offer water, they offer a connection to other kinds of mental health services, and they can't offer a bed. Um, and so I think focusing our efforts, coordinating across jurisdictions much more effectively, and ensuring that people who are going out there have real beds to offer is going to be the next step, and I'm excited to do that with all of you. So thank you all. Um, this was, I believe, just a note and file, uh, but it's a very useful note and file. Is that right? Oh, he's got no. a question. Correct, oh, you have a question? Oh, I'm so sorry. I apologize. I didn't see you raise your hand. Uh, thank you so, so much. So sorry, um, Mr. Harris Johnson. Um, and, and Go ahead. Mr. I want to thank the members for their questions, and I, I want to get a, a handle on this or uh, get your opinion about this because um, uh, it, it seems like a situation where it's you know it's it's a restaurant that doesn't have enough tables for everybody so they keep hiring new hostesses <laughs> to take your name down wow, except that in this case it's not just one restaurant hiring hostesses it's a bunch of people hiring hostesses uh, to take your name down and put you on a list I mean we account commonly encounter people in encampments that have a half dozen, 10 business cards of people that say they're going to get back to them when there's a unit available. Um, and, you know, housing is one thing. I'm going to tell you, the thing that is truly tragic for all these outreach workers, and it's amazing that there isn't more attrition in this field, is the number of times, and I've been on the street for this, and I don't even do it that often, the number of times someone says, I have a drug problem, I need treatment, and I'm ready to go. And the outreach workers, got no place to send them. Uh, and knowing full well that when you come back, that person's not likely to be at that same point of readiness. Um, so I'm, I just wanted to get a, um, I wanted to see if you all were willing to comment on, on that metaphor so we can get to the bottom of the, the, the problem. And I, I, it, my sense is a lot of us keep hiring outreach workers because that's what you can do, right? You, you can always get, sign someone up to be an outreach worker knowing full well it doesn't produce another unit of housing or another bed or another um, uh, placement in a drug treatment facility. Um, but I, I just wanted your assessment on, on how we got here, because you know, I, I uh, resist believing that people just want to, you know, that there's some, some um, outreach industrial conduct, uh, complex boondoggle happening. Um, uh, I actually want to get to the bottom of, of what's going on to see if we can bring about a solution. Go yeah, ahead. What you think. Somebody jump just, right in. Just opine. Jump like, right I'm, in. It's only an opinion I'm asking. I'm not asking for data or anything. Just an opinion. Because you've been in the data. You've, you've looked at it. Tell us what you see. I have been in the data, so I won't, I won't speak for the whole system. I don't know if there's a complex, but I would say when, when I looked down, and particularly when I took this position a year plus ago, it seemed like a lot of outreach. A lot of the things you just described here about people having mini cards and not going somewhere and being repeated by visits over and over and over was part of the early conversation about how many outreach teams are there and, and then how does it flow. And then when you start to look at, okay, well, what is the actual flow through mechanism about how that works? So if I see you in the field, then the next question that we, we haven't asked is, okay, so we did speak to you, so what is the, what is the next thing that happened? And, and so I would love to defer to that. but. What is the next thing that happens? And then, then what is the next wait after that? So we know there may be some beds. And so multiple service providers or multiple outreach groups will submit that information to the coordinator at LASA, who will then start to determine beds. So what is that process for how they're getting determined and, and who's actually moving? Uh, there 
there's a comment about there may be some ways that people are going directly around it. Uh, who's able to better manifest that and not? Are, are all these questions you bring up just bring us back to we're spending a lot of money here and, and the challenge is we all want to make sure that we're having results. And I think um, for me, I'm having a little trouble still um, seeing where everything is going. So you see us mapping things out as we're doing now. We're causing this conversation. We are working with um, LASA, but I still think there's steps to do to make sure everybody understands that by the time an outreach worker reaches somebody, whether they're talking to them or not, what did they offer them? What did they not offer them? If they did offer someone housing, what happened next? Mm -hmm. Because that's the question you haven't got to. And when it's that next one that it may go into, I can't I remember the person's name, but multiples have gone in for the same unit, for the same vacancy unit. And then who got selected? And then what happened to the rest? And then how long are they in the queue? And did, did, did anything else happen? You bring up the fact of, you know, if somebody needed some type of service from the county is what I'm going to refer it to for drug and alcohol, other, what exactly happened to them? I'm not going to propose to sit here. I actually, I don't know, but I think it's a critical issue and a challenge as well about, okay, so did they get referred to or they didn't? And I know there are, assist, there are challenges, which we are having conversations about, about how to actually track those individuals and where were the referrals made and how are they being made? And so that is a piece of uh, a conversation that we are currently having with LASA as well. And that information just can't come soon enough for this conversation. But that is an absolute live conversation. So I, I know I haven't answered your question, but that answer is still hanging out there. So uh, to opine on your, as, as you, the word you used, on your analogy, I think we, we are in the position we are uh, relative to outreach uh, for a, a couple of reasons. One, investments in outreach have been piecemeal uh, and not, um, not uh, managed through a concerted, coordinated conversation across council districts, across uh, districts between the, the city and the county, um, resulting in, uh, in investments that don't necessarily uh, make sense for the entirety of the system. I think. Uh, I think there's a disservice to the circle team to just refer to them as, home, as, as street outreach because their intention is, is unarmed crisis response, which is much more broad than, uh, than homelessness uh, outreach, street outreach. Um, but um, I think you know, the, the conversation that Council Member Rahman has been, has been leading in the Homeless um, Strategy Committee has been uh, one of how do we get to a coordinated approach to all of this work. Uh, that I think needs to be not strictly focused on outreach, but across the entirety of the system, because uh, there's there's been an over reliance on outreach as the solution to homelessness, mm -hmm. uh, because we see more and more folks out on the street, and so the the um, easy reaction or the the uh, the common reaction is we need people out there to help them, which I, I agree with. However, if we don't have the resources to help them, um, I think your analogy stands of, of the, the hostess situation. So I think it is the, the way to move forward is to have coordinated conversations about all of the investments, both outreach, interim housing, permanent housing, not just within the city, uh, but across, across council districts for the city as a whole and in collaboration with the county and the investments that it's making uh, within the city. Thank you for that. Um, and just uh, sort of one more uh, bit of digging here. So the, it seems to me that the availability of housing is relatively stable. It's not like you wake up one morning and there are a thousand additional new units, right? So um, you know, there's ebb and flow, but it, there aren't, it's not like they're big giant bursts or big giant declines. Um, so it, I guess every time we add an outreach worker, Basically, what we're doing is saying there's going to be more people on the street, I irrespective of how much housing there actually is available. Th is that accurate? Yeah, I think so. I, I think the 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 investment in outreach has been uh, has also been valuable in terms of helping people on the street survive. Uh, I mean, we saw this absolutely uh, during COVID, where I think we would have seen 
uh, dramatically, uh, you know, much more significant death rate among people experiencing homelessness from exposure from, uh, to the virus, but also to uh, lack of access to food, water, uh, the basics of survival. Um, I think we would see, uh, while there is a struggle in terms of accessing um, uh, substance abuse treatment, especially inpatient, um, without having uh, staff out there to, to make those connections where available, we would see increased uh, need relative to that out on the streets. Um, so I do think that they serve a valuable resource. However, I do agree that, the, that we need to make sure that the investments may, are made strategically across the system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harris. I'm sorry for not seeing you before. Ms. Rodriguez, Thank one you. last question to close us out. Thank you. So um, do you as LASA have an understanding? You, now we know what the city's expending uh, from our funds to support outreach. What is the expenditure? Do you have any understanding of what the county has contracted for outreach services? I don't have that number offhand, but it is uh, it is available on the county's uh, homeless initiative website. And I could okay. look that up and share that with you. And so have you all reverse engineered the deployment of those resources? I mean, are you at any, look, LASA is the, you're the, the conduit, you're the, you know, you're the connector in all of this. The biggest problem here in this matrix, what it, what it clearly shows is that there's uh, way too many chiefs, there, there's way too many bosses uh, overseeing the direction of how the outreach is being conducted. And so you have the same happening with the very same contracted service providers in many circumstances that also have different bosses that they're responding to at the county side. And so what's LASA's role to actually manage and look at reverse engineering of where these resources are being deployed? Because if they're all jump, if everyone gets to jump ahead of each other in the queue, what's LASA's role? I mean, at this point, if, you know, again, if there's any kind of conversation about, you know, kind of, you know, uh, to, to Joe Buscaino this and signing the divorce papers, this goes back to the, convert, the frustration that many people have had. Where, at what point is there an intervention where you look at where the resources are being deployed when it comes to outreach as the keeper of the, the broader system and understanding where all these placements or opportunities for placements are, right? Because all the housing providers also, you know, you guys are the keeper of, uh, of the availability of housing, of where that lives in the system, correct? Generally speaking, yes. Okay, so you know who's placing individuals where. So how do you know which service providers, I mean, can't we measure the efficacy of, of each of these service providers and what their uh, placements are so that we can actually evaluate whether or not they're worth a damn? in the work that they're doing, or they're just out making us all feel good by giving the, the bottle of water? How are we tracking and measuring the outcomes with each of these contracted service providers so that we can actually evaluate them and say, you're not cutting it? I know part of the problem is that we've got, again, too many, too many folks directing where the outreach is happening. That is the biggest, uh, you know, the, just, just on the city side. but you all can actually help measure what these service providers are doing and at what point or has there been any point where you guys have actually evaluated like who's leading the pack in terms of the placements we we do look at that data regularly uh, and can see all the outreach teams are expected required uh, to enter their data into hmis both the um, county funded teams and uh, teams funded through lasa so we have we do have uh, information. So just teams funded through LASA, but you don't know in terms of those that are contracted under H, what they're providing or what their placements are. You mean Measure H? Yes. Yes, the county funded, that's what I mean. What so you can funded. see those as well? Yes. And okay. Any, anything that's in HMIS you'd be able to see? Yes, right? absolutely. And is HMIS data connected to individual providers? Yes. Okay, great. This is, yeah, and I think that's where they're drawing some of the information from for the dashboards that they've shared with us in terms of placement rates. And I'm excited, Ms. Rodriguez, because the auditor that's going to be looking at this is, yeah. is, has been tasked with answering exactly those questions, which I think is really exciting. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that, and I think it will help us 
really reward those who are doing great and say, okay, to those who are not being able to perform, let's move on and let's put our money where it, where it actually is working. I think the challenge is, though, is that we're going to need that data. Um, and in fact, I'd, I'd like to see a report back on exactly what the outcomes are associated with each of these contracted outreach efforts, explicitly associated with all the those that are funded through the city budget, because there's going to be some leaning in this next fiscal year. So we can't wait for that audit. That's yeah, going to have no, to be, that's going to have to be, yes. that audit is going to be, uh, it, it's going to take longer because of the comprehensive nature of it. And so uh, we need to, we need to get, I, you know, we need to see that data now in the next few weeks because that's where we're going to have to have some very hard conversations in the budget process uh, to know how many, if, if people are having a lot of touch points but no placements, then that tells us everything that we need to know uh, because those, that's where the services are going to, we're going to have to lean out and really it's going to have to, 47.4 million just for the city side yeah, it's not gonna is, be. is ridiculous. Absolutely. With, and, and there's no centralized deployment. It's, uh, everyone's doing their own thing. Absolutely. So I think we just need to have that data uh, by the service providers coming out of HMIS to understand, you know, what, you know, to have some metrics and understanding of what success looks like so we can start thinning out uh, the number of contracts because this is unsustainable. Yes, absolutely. So we'll look forward to getting that information as well as we move through question, this. Yeah. Um, we have so many items to get through, and I know we have to be done at five. Is it? Go, well, go ahead. Go I'm ahead. just getting confused because the, the, how many matchers are in the system? Because it, it's the loss of matchers that are the that choke point when all these outreach workers have to go to them for the, <laughs> the housing. No. So not not all beds are matched uh, through the system, and uh, depending on the shelter, the matching criteria can vary dramatically, and so it's where there are specific uh, match criteria that our, our teams are involved. We are uh, working right now on uh, being able to automate that in the system uh, to be able to increase uh, accessibility in that way. So how many matchers are there? I, I don't know offhand. How many what are there? Match Interim housing lots, matchers. Lots of matchers, the ones who a lot of the outreach workers have to go to to get eight. to the... Eight. I just conferred eight. with my colleague. You said number eight. Eight. For these are for interim beds or for for matching to interim housing. For interim Correct. housing. But they're managing this the CES and they're matching people to sorry they're managing the process of all of the interim sites across the entire city. That ha that have matched beds that have specific criteria to match to yes. Okay, good to know. It's city and county. Okay. Eight. City and county is eight. So 60,000 homeless people, and we have eight people matching beds? This is why we've signaled in, in multiple budget requests for uh, I, questions about our, our admin rate. I think the qu part of the question here also is to, so yes, the number of matchers are really important. The biggest choke point in the entire system is bed availability overall, right? So, right. so there, it's, it's bed availability overall, and then it's like how are we filling the existing beds that we have as effectively as possible? Now, if you look across our interim sites, I think another piece of information that we really need to understand is how well are we filling up our existing interim sites? And are there differences between sites that are going through LASA's matching system and sites that are being controlled through the city or through the county in other ways? Are there significant vacancies at sites um, that have other, other ways of filling up those beds? Because a number of the city-funded sites actually have other pathways of filling up interim beds. Well, so okay. I think that's another piece okay. of information that we absolutely need to know as we move through this process. And we have to have some control. We used to have an ability to reverse match on the district level, and yeah. then there was a decision that was made in a very opaque manner that did not, that we seemed to take away our ability to do that. Um, so part of it is how is it being done, and then who's, who's making those decisions, and how do we make sure that we are, uh, as the council, making those decisions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'll get, and I, you know, I've been looking at information across the interim sites in my district to look at different rates of um, fullness and, you know, how many beds are open and trying to make sure that we're filling open beds quickly. But I think it's definitely a system-wide question that we have to make sure that we address as we move forward. So given that, I think these are really great questions. I think it gives our internal um, discussions 
real ammunition, real, real momentum as we move forward. I know the CLA um, staff is over there feeling very, very, somewhere, they were there, feeling very excited about um, how do we actually solve this problem. But, you know, I think it took us a very long time to get this information. My hope is that it won't take as much inf time to get the remaining pieces of information, matchers, bed availability, and Ms. Rodriguez's questions around effectiveness of teams in order for us to be able to make decisions as we move into this very tight budget cycle. So thank you all. Any additional questions from the committee? Seeing none, let's call the roll. Uh, to note and file, Madam Chair. It's a note and file? Okay, so do we need to call yes. the roll? Yes, okay, go ahead. Council Member Rahman. Yes. Council Member Blumenfield. Aye. Council Member Harris Dawson. Yes. Council Member Rodriguez. Aye. Council Member Lee. Aye. Five eyes and this item is noted thank in file. You, thank you all so much. And you know, I'm, I will say that I am grateful, even as we continue to bring up some of the same issues, that we are now moving from talking about these issues in abstractions to talking about them in specifics. That is a step towards solving these problems. So I'm grateful for that and grateful for this committee's patience as we move through that very, very laborious process. Let's move on to items two and three, the HEA reports. Do committee members have questions on these two reports? Um, I'm sorry, two and three? Yeah. You want to read those items yes, into Madam the Chair. record? Items number two and three are city administrative officer reports relative to the homelessness emergency account general city purposes fund 12th and 13th status reports for the weeks ending in February 16th and March 15th, 2024. Okay, so we have I, uh, remaining, we have items four and item one. Um, and so if members have questions, I think we can open this up. Do you need to make a presentation? Or do you You're welcome to. I just. I believe it would be best if up to you guys if you guys would like us to kind of run through a quick summary or if you just want to jump straight into questions for time. I have read the reports. I think it's up to committee members. Do you want to hear a presentation? No. You want to jump into questions? Let's do it. Are there questions from the committee? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, let us start with uh, Ms. Rodriguez and then we, if we can take one question at a sure. time. Sure. Um, and so I Partially, I mean, it's hard for me to ask the CAO because I, I, these are questions that are really should be poised more so to the mayor's office, but I understand they're not going to be coming to any more committees. No, um, they'll, they, will, they will come. Oh, good. Okay, yeah, they will okay. come, but they're not coming to every committee meeting. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, what I'd like to know if there's been any uh, additional information to understand the methodology, the approach, the strategy into which encampments get selected as part of Insight Safe. Ed Gibson, CAO's office. Um, and if you want to punt that, you know, punt that question to the mayor's office, that's fine. But yeah, go ahead. I do want to punt that question to the mayor's office. I do know they also opened up the portal for council offices to put in suggestions, is my understanding as well. But as for the detail of how they individually get sorted, I know it's also tied to uh, motel or hotel availability um, as well. So those things all kind of tie together, but they would be best to answer that question in detail. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's why it's hard to have you all here uh, because I know that before this most recent Insight Safe operation, my staff had to submit eight times even before we got an acknowledgement that through that portal that the locations were received. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and so, you know, look, I'm looking forward to a comprehensive audit of all of our work. It's very, it's a very expensive endeavor, um, as we just had in the pre in the preceding conversation. Uh, we don't got, we don't have a lot of money to to be. I'm just curious if you guys were informed or aware of what the selection process or anything has been in terms of. Uh, what the deployment looks like, how, how, what's the process of identifying which encampments, because I know there have been several locations that have had repeated visits, and again, it's just kind of like, what, it, what is the process? So I'll, I'll save that for when, do we know when the mayor's office is gonna come? Uh, I can, so I'll send you that information as soon as we have it. Confirmed. Okay, yeah, because I, I, $250 million, there's, one entity that's controlling it, if there's no report back from the, enti the entity controlling it, it kind of, it, it's, I don't understand why we have the CAO here uh, to report back on it. So, okay. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Now I'm gonna violate my own rule. I'm gonna ask a bunch of questions, but they're very brief. So, um, can you uh, tell me about um, 
the Mayfair is going to be open to accept transfers according to this report in May of 2024. Are we on track to meet that? That should be an easy one. Uh, as of the last conversation I heard with the uh, uh, Bureau of Engineering and the Mayor's Office in GSD, that is still the target date for is there, people to start moving in. Yes. Okay. Are there additional funds that the city will need to sp um, spend in order to fund the construction and repairs at the Mayfair than we've already seen? Um, per the last MFC report a while ago, the uh, Bureau of Engineering reported uh, approximately an $8 million um, difference that, uh, of increased costs that needed to be covered. That was covered through a, varied meeting, uh, a variety of ways, but they all stayed inside the inside safe budget at this And it hasn't time. increased since the last time we spoke. It has not increased. That number has not changed yet. How can the council provide feedback on the RV strategy and when will it be presented to council? Um, that two different RV type strategies. So there is the report back that was tied to a motion that the CAO was working on and we are working on that report back now. Um, and then there is the RV task force for which the mayor's office. These have to be the same strategies. It's one city. So love to find a way to make sure that we're all working on the same strategy, not duplicating efforts. What's the best way for us to make sure that we're doing that? Well, I think you just stating it and what I was getting ready to finish off is we are taking the commentary from that along with the stuff that we're doing um, and marrying them in the, the passion in the fashion that actually. And passion. We can do passion too, thank you. But that actually works because there's a, a good deal of technical issues in there. So we have an RV strategy and a path. We, with a good number of you, we have probably about, in the CAO's office, at least nine RV actions, maybe 10 this week alone. So we do have a path. but. What one of the things we need to do is be able to increase capacity and one of the things we're currently challenged with is storage lots and those things so expanding that and making another path so that we can do more and um, work with other providers including uh, cd7's pilot and incorporating those types of things but making it so um, it could be expanded citywide so that is what we're trying to do in our report so i'd like to make right an explicit now. request that we move forward with a single strategy and that all of our city dollars that are being applied to rvs are moving in the same direction finally it sounds like there's been progress on standing up the forward inside safe program uh, or c um, platform there we go uh, which is going to make motel invoicing more efficient and i in your last um, uh, testimony on that you mentioned that your staff was spending 15 to 20 hours a week, and many staff members were spending 15 to hours, 20 hours a week on invoicing. When will this be fully operational? Um, and are staff spending less time on invoicing now that we've moved forward a little bit on this? Uh, staff time is still the same with regards to the amount of work with Inside Safe and the invoices on the RVs. The contract is drafted, and we're currently uh, going back and forth with the city attorney's office with issues. So. Uh, if things get resolved there, then we get to move to what technically is the ED3 process through the mayor's office for review of contracts. So um, it is drafted, and with the city attorney's office, there are still a few okay. questions. I'd to like to request that. that we move as quickly as possible on this because Absolutely. it is an incredible investment of your time that is actually <laughs> yes. supposed to be serving the entire homeless services system, um, including all of the different investments that the city's making, not just on Inside Safe. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Councilmember Blumenfield. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a sort of two questions. One, um, you look at the chart under the future fiscal year obligations, and it, it appears like we're rolling over 11 million or, or suggesting to roll over 11 million in rental assistance uh, to next year. And at the same time, you know, we learned that there are challenges spending the time limited subsidy and that, I mean, obviously Inside Safe has unspent money in that category. So what if we wanted to spend that money on master leasing? What are the steps that we would need to do to uh, to get more money into master leasing or potentially use the, the, the money that's not being spent this year that's been allocated toward master leasing? So with regards to the inside safe budget, which is, I will say just the, it is the mayor's budget for which we are tracking the categories. They have stated that, um, and they are best to state their intentions, but they have stated that they intend to use um, uh, that time limited subsidy uh, funds uh, the reality is of how it's shown in the sheet is that the way they when they expect it to start will roll into the next few uh, future fiscal year so it'll only encumber the, still the 250 million dollars but is their intention to roll it into the way it starts will be using it'll be happening in the next fiscal year so i think it's kind of a conversation with 
uh, bringing them back and asking them about their plan and how they roll forward. We are just commenting on how we see the funding being spent per their per their yeah. comments. So it's, but until it's spent, you are correct, it's not out the door, so. Okay, no, I, and I get that, and that, that's probably more better directed to them, and it's just I know mass releasing is a priority for all of us here, so we're trying to move in that direction. And then, you're talking about the uh, Mayfair, are there other properties that are gonna be used with the inside safe for general fund dollars to acquire other properties? I know there's several, right? Uh, at this not for at this point for acquiring properties um, and inside safe dollars no not that I know of and someone correct me if I'm which one I guess for oh, the home, oh, the home key those money. are already in place sorry fair enough she, you're referring to the, the project home key three allocation. I'm assuming that's what that's yes yeah, the sorry. extent of it I don't know if there's I, I asked it broadly because I didn't know if there was something else got you thank you for that reminder here so inside the budget already was the acknowledgement that they the the some of the funds inside the budget were set aside for Project Home Key 3, and I don't remember the exact amount, please tell me what it is, but um, to help acquire properties. Beyond those that are listed inside the uh, documents already, there is nothing else forecast because that is the limited amount of money that they have available. Okay, so. and, and part of it I ask, because when we acquire money with, with general fund, um, we have much greater flexibility. Correct. And um, to serve a lot of different populations, and, and obviously, we have a lot more local control. And so following up is like, how are the policies set for matching and placement of people in these buildings where we're using our own funds? Who is responsible in the city for recommending the housing placement for, uh, for this policy, for, for this council to adapt? So, because we don't need the CES system. So how do we, how do we make that policy of who's gonna, how those um, housing placements are gonna be made in those well, for buildings. this particular instance, I believe we're going to need to have this conversation with the mayor's office on their exact intention. If it was traditional interim housing, it would be coordinated as normal through it uh, through LASA. So if they have some other other intention about how they're going to do matching for the interim housing, they would need to um, make a comment on that if they were having something specific. So much like the Mayfair, that was a very specific way about how it was going to happen. So we were all in, informed on that. So, I guess I'm putting a flag in there too, because the, the they who should be making that decision is is also the this Co horseshoe. Correct. I shall I should clarify, the mayor's office may have a plan, so they would need to share that plan with all of us. Okay. And then have the discussion. Thank you. The they is the we. Yes. Any other questions from members of this committee? No. Nope. Okay, look forward to getting clarity on that and hopefully we can bring that back to this committee uh, in terms of um, who is actually gonna be making decisions on any investments that we make here. I wanted to um, move this forward but with one additional instruction which is instruct the CAO and request the, mayor, the office of the mayor to report to the council for approval of the Mayfair services contract with Weingart um, as well as for approval of any other contracts that directly or indirectly set an interim housing bed rate um, because we are having a separate parallel discussion on that and I don't want to end up in the same situation that we did this past year where we're paying two different amounts of money for services um, across the entire city. So um, can I get a second for that amendment? Second. Thank you. And with that, uh, can you please call the roll, Mr. Rano? I think you have to call each one separately. Uh, yes, Madam Chair. For the amendment, would you like that to go on to the latest um, council the file, latest which one. is The latest one okay. to um, item, yeah. Great, exactly. and then we could actually note and file item number three, so we could take the vote as one. Okay, great. Yeah, with item two as amended. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Bloomfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Aye. Five ayes. And these Item number two as amended, and item number three noted and filed. Okay, great. Um, let's move on to item four, which is the 23rd roadmap report. Can you read that item into the record, please? Yes, Madam Chair. Item number four are statutory exemptions and city administrative officer and Bureau of Engineering reports relative to funding allocation and lease extension for continued use of the tiny home villages slash navigation centers located at 6099 Laurel Canyon Boulevard, 1221 North Figueroa Place, and 18616 West Topham Street, aka 6073 North Reseda Boulevard for those experiencing homelessness, 
and the lease construction and operation of the residential interim housing slash navigation center at 600 East 116th place for those experiencing homelessness and the 23rd report regarding COVID-19 homelessness roadmap funding recommendations and related matters. Thank you, Mr. Rano. Um, and we have, uh, again, our CAO friends on this item. Uh, did you wanna make any uh, initial remarks before we start questions? Um, we, we can prepare a presentation or I can present if the committee wishes or we can Does the committee require a presentation? I have a couple of questions. Do you need a presentation? No. No, no presentation is required. Um, let me ask just one question to kick us off. In this report, I notice that there's some um, differences between the stated costs and the funding that was allocated. If I'm, if we're read, if my, you know, we're staff, my staff and I are reading it right. Um, the cost of urban alchemy was $91 a night and the funding was $145 a night. CAO's cost for Hope the Mission was $60.50 and then was funded at $112 a night. Can you talk a little bit about those differences between the costs and what they were funded at? So Annabelle Gonzalez with the CAO's office. Um, so the, the bed rates for the Alvarado Tiny Home Village and CD13 did fluctuate throughout the year. It did not receive any additional increase within the recently approved um, interim housing bed rate report. Um, so for this particular site, the, the shortfall in operations were um, flagged earlier in the year. So as seen in previous reports, we did attempt to close the funding gap in operations to ensure that the site would not close. Um, so the, I think it's the 149 bed rate, that is the average amount per bed that the site was operating at and at the request of the council office and our office um, in, an, in an effort to reduce funding, um, Urban Alchemy did end up moving forward with the skeleton crew um, and that was at, at about the $91 bed rate. Um, and since this site is now up for renewal um, for both the lease and the sublease, we are using this time, this opportunity to transition over to a to Hope the Mission, the new um, service provider that can provide the full range of services at a higher cost, um, but this ensures that they are not at a skeleton crew. This will be at the full operation of the site. So you're, so just so I understand, the process for some of these increases is basically happening on a site-by-site -site or an ad hoc basis, parallel to a process that's happening citywide where we're trying to determine a bed rate that works for across sites, is that right? So, yes. yeah. no, technically yes, that is, that is correct. So each individual site, so we are working with LASA, with the CLA and with the county mm -hmm. to come to a standardized formula for what these yes. nightly bed rates are. We are right. having an agreement right now that we are at 60.1 for the most part, but we have various sites that may have economies of scale issue, too small, too big for which you can't get to a good standardized rate that keeps everything fluctuating. Then we also have whatever agreement may have been made for additional services or something else, or maybe it's even additional security or something else in the site that also has a fluctuation. Then on top of that, you have operators who are having whatever issue it is with operating the site in the way that they've described that they said they were gonna do, and then they come back and they have a shortfall for whatever reason, and then we're trying to resolve what that is, get it standardized, and mm -hmm. figure out how to resolve that on a go-forward basis. And you're seeing that, all of that, into this conversation of your question, which is a great question, by the way, and then follow through with why. No, sorry, I'm going to be on But one of the reasons why we want to get stuff more standardized is we need to have a clear path on mm -hmm. what it is that's happening at each site. Why is it differing? Not just because of size, but yeah. what is the actual scope of work yes. that has thrown this off to some degree? Yes. And you know, they're older contracts or their previous contracts, so we're, we're having to open them up each time when this issue comes. Yes. And so we're solving the problem for now, and we're looking to solve the problem, period, going, f as going and again, forward. And I just want to say the ad hoc process is also a process which is 
very difficult to hold accountable. Yeah. So it, I have some real challenges with it. I understand why these changes have been made, but we, we just have to move more quickly towards standardizing these things going forward, and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, that was my questions. Other members? Mr. Blumenfield, you had questions on this. Go ahead. Yeah, a couple things. Um, the recommendation nine of the roadmap report on uh, lists the HAP contract. 28 is the roadmap contract. And I know that the roadmap contract requires metrics to be shared with the city on a quarterly basis. So who, who is responsible for monitoring these contracts? Um, have we been getting these reports? Do we get to see them in committee? What, sorry, Mr. Bloomfield, what reports are supposed to be shared on a quarterly basis with the city? The, the recommendation nine lists the uh, roadmap contract and the contract requires different metrics that oh, they list out. Metrics, sorry. That, are, that have to be shared on a quarterly basis. And there's a whole series of questions that, they, that those metrics are supposed to, to have. And I, I don't know who, like who monitors that uh, and have they have have we been adhering to that contract and getting that information quarterly? Uh, good afternoon, Mindy Patasana with the Office of the CAO. So, the Housing Department is the contract administrator, and it, it is part of their contract between LASA and LHD to submit quarterly performance metrics based on what was established in the scope of work. So, the Housing Department is responsible for monitoring that and for. Uh, and they do coordinate with LASA to receive that on a quarterly basis. So, so housing is getting it on a quarterly basis, the, those metrics? Correct. And then uh, is there a way to, to make that public or for us to be able to see that as well? Uh, we can discuss with the, we'll have to discuss with the housing department on how they would like to address that. That's a great question. We can definitely follow up on that. Yeah. Okay. It's great. I mean, it, it's obviously, it's public information, so we should be able to do it. We just need to figure out a way to, to do that Systematically. Systematically, transparently, uh, et cetera. So that, that would be great to get to get those reports moving. I um, also wanted to ask about recommendation 11. It moves funding from a, a, a safe sleep site. Does safe sleep qualify for the alliance? It does. You're shaking your head yes. Uh, safe sleep is an intervention that would qualify towards the alliance, yes. And so what are some of the parameters to set up a safe, safe it's a tongue twister, safe sleep site with Sally selling the seashells. Uh, so it might be an option for us to look, look into if we, if we start scaling. So, you know, is this something that we've been looking at? Is, are there parameters that we need to set up for that? I know we have, we have one, right? That Correct. We have one site in CD9. Um, the, I believe it's the Lincoln Theater. Um, essentially, it is a sanctioned encampment in which um, individuals are able to live within their tent and receive 24-hour services such as case management, meals, um, hygiene services. Um, what all we would need, um, from my understanding, for this type of intervention is an empty lot, very similar to safe parking. Um, of course, we would also take into consideration um, surrounding area, um, current use of the lot, um, availability, and all that. Um, but that is a program that would count towards the Alliance. Okay. Hey, uh, hey, making sure that the term of the agreement for that must meet the terms of alliance as well. So it would need to go past the June 13th, 2027 date, because that is the date that the interventions are counted under alliance. Right. So if it, if it closed, so anything that's, yeah, so. Right. We need to make sure everything gets to that date. Correct. If we want to get the county money, I mean, this is what, why we moved that item this morning as well, to, to make sure that we're it's counting toward the alliance, and, and more importantly, that we're getting the county to, to pay its fair share on it. Correct. And so b because we have two different litigation suits that are settlements there, Roadmap has a path, which is this report and um, that we talk about for certain things for which we also receive county proceeds um, to be used in a variety of ways. But under alliance, um, we must hit that target date to make that requirement. And once we do that, then services are just paid for um, by the county, so it's not them giving us money. They're just responsible for paying for the services. Right. So, right. thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions from members of the committee about item four? Seeing none, um, I think we can move on. Do we need to? Uh, vote as amended, Madam Chair. Vote as amended? Correct. Okay, great. 
Councilmember Robin. Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Aye. Five ayes, and this item is approved as amended. Thank you very much. Um, and we are at our last item, I believe. Thank you, CAO staff, for being here. Um, item one, the LA Grand Demobilization. Could you please read that into the record? Yes, Madam Chair. Item number one is a Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority reports relative to an update on the LA Grand Hotel Demobilization Plan. And we have Mr. Fernandez here from LASA for this item. Um, and I don't, again, I've read the report. Do we need a presentation? No. Okay, great. So uh, I want to start off. Did we already read the item into the agenda? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Chair. sorry. Um, I want to ask uh, just a very obvious question, I think, the most concerning question to me, which is that there are actually more people at the Grand now than when we started this. Um, 449 versus 432. Can you talk a little bit more about why the numbers have gone up in the time that we've um, been spending on demobilizing? Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Miguel Fernandez, ICANN Director of Interim Housing. Uh, the reason that the numbers have uh, stayed elevated is because of efforts from the mayor's office to bring people in doors as part of Inside Safe, with the commitment that those individuals who are coming in will be connected to Inside Safe projects as part of the demobilization. So there is a path for them um, once the project starts to close on May 1st. Okay. Um, and the, again, I asked this question to the CAO. Uh, the Mayfair will supposedly be ready by May 1st, and DHS and the encampment resolution participants can start moving in then. Are we on track, according to you, to meet that deadline? Yes, we are. Okay, great. Um, that is all my questions so far. Other questions for committee members? Mr. Blumenfield. Great. Um, some of the participants, I think 30 of, of the 110, are linked to housing navigation, some time limited subsidies. How does it get determined who gets the housing navigation and who gets the rental subsidies? Uh, well, the rental subsidy comes when somebody gets connected to housing and is moving in. They don't come beforehand. So they're getting housing navigation. Once they find a unit, then they're getting the rental, as, uh, rental assistance. The determination as to who gets it, those are already slots allocated. These are individuals at the Grand already that have the housing navigations. We're not going through the list of participants and getting them more housing. Right now, we are in the stage of demobilizing, so the participants that had housing navigation and TLS linkage, those are the ones that are being assisted with permanent housing, making sure that they're moving towards permanent housing, but no additional resources for housing navigation and TLS are being deployed to the site. Okay. And what about determining who's eligible for DHS participants? Well, the grant itself is an encampment. They all are DHS. Okay. Well, with the exception of some, uh, some legacy clients that were there before the, uh, the switch over from PRK to DHS. Outside of the Mayfair, how do you get enrolled in the DHS program? Outside of the Mayfair, how do I get it? How they, they get enrolled in DHS as a service alone or as part of this encampment resolution effort? As well, both. I mean, as part of the encampment resolution effort, ideally. Yeah. So there's various uh, encampment resolution efforts going on in in, uh, in the county, and as part of an encampment, they are identified and they're provided services through that encampment identification. So as an encampment is being cleared, uh, DHS is working with those individuals that are there for their projects and they're assisting them. Is this working? Okay. Yep. Yes. Uh, I know it takes a second. It just pull it close. Yeah. Yes. Um, so Nathaniel Fagao uh, with LASA, um, specifically for the uh, project at the Grand that is moving to the Mayfair, this is part of the county's uh, encampment resolution grant uh, through the state that is specifically dedicated to uh, high acuity individuals from Skid Row. Uh, so the uh, essential identification uh, is uh, that they were residing unsheltered on Skid Row. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from members of the committee? Thank you um, for your presentation. I will say I do remain concerned about this site. Um, we have an obligation to pay for 80% of the rooms, even when we are using a smaller amount. I know now we're using a much larger percentage of the rooms. Um, and demobilization is a long process, as I know from sites that have demobilized in my district. So I really just want to say that I would appreciate it if LASA leadership and others could reach out to us 
in advance of their coming to a crisis point, well in advance, to ask for the resources that you need in order to make this demobilization work effectively. What I really don't want is to be close to the end of our stated lease time with the grand and to hear that we still have 80 participants in the grand for whom we have no options and that we are forced because of that because we don't want a single person returning to the street because of our um, decisions we're forced to then continue payments to the grand as a result of this so I just want to make a, a request and underscore that request to you we are here for you please reach out to tell us what we what you need in order to make this a successful demobilization and to ensure that every single person is connected to the resources that they need and please do it well in advance of the deadline. We hear you clearly and we appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay, um, do we need to do anything on this? Uh, we could either vote to note and file the reports or we can continue the item since it's an ongoing update. Okay, let's continue it to okay. our next meeting. All right. That's okay, it. great, thank you very much uh, to both of you and are, are there any other items on the desk? The desk is clear, Madam Chair. Yay, thank you all for a wonderfully efficient meeting. This meeting is adjourned.